Welcome everybody to Wiki Tree 2023. I'm, my name is Sandy, and I am so pleased to announce One Place Studies. One Place Studies happens to be my addiction to Wiki Tree, and we've got a great group here with us to help us learn a little bit about what One Place Studies is about, how to get started, and also share their own personal journeys with their own One Place study. So I think right off the bat, let me introduce everybody. So we have Azure, that is a project leader with One Place Studies, as well as Amy, who's a project leader with One Place Studies. And we're going to learn about their very interesting One Place Studies along with their members, Lucas, Trisha, and Donna. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining Wiki Tree Day 2023 with One Place Studies. How's everybody doing? Great. Great. We're good. <laughs> Glad to be here. I know. This is really, really exciting for me. So I am going to enjoy watching each of you present your One Place studies and learn a little bit more about your areas that you're researching. And I think the very first thing to do is let me go ahead and have Azure tell us a little bit about what One Place studies is all about and take it from there, Azure. All right. So the project page is the place to kind of get started if you have an interest in One Place Studies. Uh, as the intro kind of explained, it's a study of one place. And um, as you can see on the, the, the project page, it has our uh, mission and goal. And then if you scroll down a little bit further, you can see how to join. And it has a link to the D2G welcome post for joining the project. And also on this page is um, the links for how to get started, resources, and et cetera. So you see that across the top of the page there. So also on the page as example studies and types of studies that we have. So, if so something as small as a building all the way up to a city or town. So it kind of just gives you an idea. You can go out and check out those studies and see what others are doing. And that kind of helps you get, get an idea of how you want to do your study. Also on the page is what's going on. So we have now 300 members and over 620 studies at Wikitree. We have a uh, project newsletter that goes out biannually, and that's linked on this uh, project page as well. And uh, yeah, just a little bit further down, down towards the bottom of the page is where that is. Yeah, there you go. Oh, you just passed it. <laughs> it's right above the One Place Studies map. Yeah, there's the link to the past um, newsletters. And then also, uh, she, Sandy shared the um, One Place Studies map that Steve Harris developed. So it's a little bit different. There's a couple different kinds of maps. So this map shows you, if you click on it, it takes you into a map of all the studies on Wikitree. So it really gives you an idea of where in the world we have One Place Studies. And we have studies all over the world, which is really exciting to me. So you can kind of go out there and see um, where they all are and drill down and actually go into a study if you want. So back on the project page, um, we have also, you can link up to where the how to join section is. You can see a link to uh, the project members. So everybody who has the badge for One Place Studies and also, there's a link that takes you to the types of studies, and you can drill down by the type of study or by the location. There's a link also there for frequently asked questions. 
So lots of good information just right there on the project page. So that's all about the project page and about one place studies at Wikitree. Now we'll go ahead and talk about my study that got me started at Wikitree doing one place studies. And that was um, my aunt, uh, Naomi Anderson. She had written a book about her husband's ancestry and the place Andersonia, California, California is actually named after his great grandfather. So it's her husband's great grandfather, um, Henry Neff, Neff Pap Anderson. And um, it's kind of a, a ghost town now. There's nothing really left there. There's a lot of pictures. You can kind of see what's left of the town. Um, not much. And that's Henry on his horse in the Redwood Forest there. So he bought uh, the property and he's a, a, lim a lumberman from Michigan and uh, moved to Washington State and was involved in the timber history of the Pacific Northwest. Unfortunately, he died there in a mill accident. So after that, it kind of, nothing ever really happened. They kept trying to get it to come back and do something with it, but it just kind of had a disaster after disaster kind of happen. So um, if you scroll down a little bit further, you can see that's all that's left is what, what's there, all that remains in 2011. So the way that I did this study, because it's for a specific time period and there weren't very many people who would, were there, is I just put a table out on the page and I've got everybody who was a resident there and then where they're originally from, who they were or um, what their occupation was, and then whether they were there for that census or not. So it's just kind of broken it down that way. And then the last column shares whether or not they're connected to the global tree. So everybody but two people on this table are connected. <laughs> so that's kind of was exciting to me that I was able to get everybody connected to the tree. And, and interestingly, there were a lot of connections between the people uh, at the location. So that was really fun to, to research. So we, um, the other maps that are available for one place studies is if you go to the category for this study or any study, Yeah, if you go into the category for Andersonia, California, one place study, uh, no, the next category, yeah, there you go. And that'll open the category page for you. And you'll see there under map of profiles, Wikitree plus maps. So if you click that open, that's a map of all the profiles in that study. So that gives you, um, you can, look at different layers like uh, birth and death, uh, migration, all, all of those types of things, um, whatever you select. So it's really gives you a lot of different ways to look at your, your study and the profiles within it, which is really so some of the be best parts of Wikitree is um, all of the different apps and tools that are created by the different volunteers. So, um, my tips and tricks that I just want to share is that you can, like I have on my page, you can use a table as a checklist for each person in the study um, over time, whether they were there for that time period or not. Um, you can use supplemental pages if it's a larger study. So on another study that I have, um, I have actually um, a supplemental space page for each census just because there are so many people and so just different ways to use free space pages as a supplemental page for the study just to kind of support the research and then also um, at the top of the page you'll see I think that's this one I actually requested out in G2G the um, genealogist to genealogist forum 
request for help. So um, you can definitely reach out and ask for volunteers um, for your study because there might be somebody who's interested in your town or maybe they're from there. So uh, don't, don't hesitate to ask for help. And the last one I wanted to share a resource is Library of Congress and Chronicling America, Internet Archive, local universities, museums, and societies. So on this on this uh, study, some of the places that I'm referencing in the sources are from um, the museums or the colleges or universities in the area, or uh, just in the state of California. Um, had some images or some information. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's Andersonia, California. If anybody has any questions about that, just feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to help. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Donna. She has a Peak Home Orphanage that she's going to talk about. Thank you, Azure. Um, I started my journey into the One Place Studies with the Peak Home Orphanage. It interested me. We had a our historical society put on a presentation in 2021 regarding this, and it actually is less than five miles from my house. I have zero people that were there. I have um, no um, no genealogical connection to it, but the story I thought was very fascinating. Um, our historical society doesn't have, we're a very small town. Um, they don't have a website. They have trouble maintaining one due to technology and lack of, you know, volunteers, that type of thing. So I thought this was my way to contribute and bring awareness for these because, so this orphanage was started in 1916. Um, a family had moved out into the middle of the country, not in a town. It was a self-supporting um they did their own farming. They did their own laundry. They did everything themselves. They grew all of their own food, cooked their own food. Um, the family, um, the wife was the last to pass and she left it to be an orphanage. And she was, um, it had to be created by March 1st of 1916 or it would revert back to the family. Uh, so they literally borrowed a pair of twins from another orphanage to meet the deadline. And from there, uh, there was over 300 children that were uh, housed in this orphanage at one time. So what I did with this, if you go to the very top, um, I made a table for the sections right there just to make it easy. I thought the navigation was easier. Um, I made a general timeline for it. There's so many options with the One Place Studies. You can literally... Um, can literally make it your own. What someone else does with theirs may not apply to yours. Um, and I sent, sourced it just like a, a profile. So in that timeline, I sourced the censuses. It was, it was running for the 1920, 1930, 1940, and 1950 census. So I was able to actually source those and there's links to those in the source section. Um, I also created sections for staff members. It's a fairly large study in some respects. Um, there was over 300 residents and near, as many staff almost. There's just unlimited numbers of people. This was this is a marathon and not a sprint. It is something I'll work over over time because it just unable to create in a short amount of time. Um, one of the things that I uh, really intended with this is because I don't have a, a link to this, but I thought if I had a person in a orphanage, I would love to have something like this to know who to contact, where the records might be housed. So um, that's one of my main goals in this was just to give people a way to, to connect. As I was creating these four profiles, one of the things that Wikitree en enables is the connection to others, the collaboration. When I entered, if you go to Edna Baker's pictures, when I was entering the residence, I was trying to link up to profiles. I was creating profiles for them. Edna's profile was already created in Wikitree and was managed by her daughter. And her daughter, um, contact. I asked her, she was private, 
it wasn't open so I could connect it. Um, so when I asked her, she's like, oh, I have pictures. And so these are pictures from the 1920s that Edna's daughter provided that our historical society had not had previously. They, they had only had pictures from the 1950s, um, not these older ones. So just the connection of Wikitree is really beneficial to these studies. Um, I also connected with, I believe it was Azure's grandmother's cousin. He was in this orphanage and he was in one of these pictures. The There's a picture of two boys on a sled or a wagon. And so I was her so great, excited I, about that. Yeah, and when I went to connect his, his profile, it was already created and it was managed by Azure. So there was a picture for her, for her family tree. Just a coincidence I never expected to find. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, let's see, this one's nice because it is not open-ended. The orphanage shut in 1961 as the social, um, social things, um, changed and there was more foster families, less need for the actual homes. Um, so yeah, this, I really enjoyed doing this one. It's unlimited what you can do with these studies. My next study I think is going to be, uh, we found a doctor's book of 750 births. He was a home, he was in his own house and he traveled to the places, but I'm going to do a one house study, I think, with those once we get those indexed. So just unlimited, but I really enjoyed being able to set this up. And you see here in residence, I was able to create profiles. As you get down farther, there's some that I, that I could not find death dates for, so I've linked their parents. So it isn't just that you, like here, the probable mother is, you know, Dorothy Gain. The, the daughter is probably deceased, but I can't prove that. So I've been able to link something else to make it more accessible and findable for descendants. So as you can see, I have a lot to go. And that's my orphanage study. So I will pass this on to Lucas. Hello. Uh, well, my one place study, I think it's coming up here, is um, on Meadowstone, which is a home. So it's a very specific location. And I started this because I live in the home. <laughs> um, another purpose uh, over on the right, you can see pictures all the way around the house after its restoration. One of the purposes, aside from learning the history of the home, is to create a source um, that is not a vital statistic. So it's something that all the people attached to this home, you know, you can learn more about their culture and the way they lived and the way their farms were. Um, and even the neighbors, you know, the neighbors can compare to this, you know, if they say on the agricultural census, they grew 10 bushels of corn in this farm, grew 100 bushels of corn, you know, you can learn something from that that you're not going to learn from a vital statistic. So uh, as you scroll down, there's, um, I've done an imprint because it is listed in three different books. And I just included that information and all of the information when it was put on the uh, National Historic Registry. Um, it was part of the Miller's Run Historic District, and that includes eight homes um, that were put on in the 70s. And only three are still surviving at this point. Um, one of the reference books that it's listed in is actually on the county a history of the county told through historic buildings. And I think that after this study, I will do other studies of local homes uh, to get a greater picture of the community. And I think that, that that would be beneficial to have several small studies like this linked together under the county or community. Then below that, I have added information about the population, of course, um, and I've split that in between owners and residents. Um, I started out with the first owner in 1775 uh, with, the, with the land grant, and 
a lot of that research is very difficult because uh, unfortunately Scott County is a burned county. Um, so many of the records are lost and some of it is a little uh, speculation at this point um, as to the transfer from person to person. And even in fact, who actually built the house. <laughs> We're not quite sure at this point at what point the house was built. Um, so of course that's interesting, and this is the South. So there were lots of enslaved people uh, on this property, and that information can uh, come in handy as well. Um, I've included a lot of the tax lists because that you know, gives you more detail um, into the life uh, of the people that were living here at the time. And if you go down to uh, when Walter Tisdale owned the property in 1865, they actually taxed him for a piano, which I thought was interesting. It was valued at $200. Now, most of my family, their property, if they happened to own property, was valued at $200. So these people had a piano for $200. And at that time, this building was over 75 years old. So that tells us that, you know, the it was still considered a relatively nice house. Yet 15 years later in 1880, the family that owned it were paying taxes on the farm, but they were living in the census record in Lexington. So from 1880 until 2012, it was used as a tenant house. Um, and the farms here were farmed by tenant families, not the owner. So farther down in the population, I have include, included other residents, which would include all enslaved people and um, all of the tenant farmers. Unfortunately, a lot of the tenant farmers are unknown, and I have yet to create a lot of those, those profiles, and hopefully the WikiTree Black Heritage Project will help me with, with some of those. Um, and below that, I have included information about the restoration because it was a vacant house when we purchased the property. Um, in about 2012. Oh, there, you can see two pictures of what the house looked like when we obtained it. And then we actually moved another home, a 1799 log home from Harrison County, which is our neighboring county, and rebuilt it as an addition to this property. So I think part of this study, I will also include the families that lived in that home. I just have not got that part yet. <laughs> um, and then you can see down there what it looks like today. Jeffrey Gillespie did most of the restoration and it did a wonderful job. But I hope that this small study, you know, will provide a source. I mean, it does for myself, but for other researchers and eventually as I continue um, to do small studies like this of neighboring historic buildings, I think the grouping of them together will make a great uh, source for the for genealogical research in the community. And after that, I think I will pass it over to Tricia, who will be telling us about Enterprise. Hello, everyone. Uh, I had to move to Florida about three years ago, and one way that I could learn more about Florida was do a one-place study. Uh, they are kind of addictive, so I've got some other studies about the areas in Kentucky where my great-grandparents lived, and those have been instructive because I've learned a lot about uh, their neighbors, and it's helped me uh, in that research way. But this one, I much like uh, what Donna said, none of these people are particularly related to me, and the Enterprise is part of Volusia County, and it was formed about around 1855. And it was a steamboat stop. It was the ends because so the St. John's River comes down from Jacksonville and meanders down toward the toward Orlando. And uh, so they had these big steamships that would come down there. And Jacob Brock built a big hotel there. And the hotel has since been changed into the Methodist home. But if you scroll on down a little bit, Sandy, what you'll see uh, when you go there is you'll see that some of the pylons from the uh, from the dock are still there. And my, my mama was kind enough to go over with me so we could take a bunch of pictures of it. 
but it, um, it had kind of a little bit of a sad ending because when the railroads started coming down through uh, Florida, for Mr. Flagler built all the railroads, uh, the thing that happened is that everyone wanted to go to the beach. They didn't want to go hang out by uh, the beautiful St. John River. So that took that essentially somewhat killed um, Enterprise. And Mr. Brock, who built the hotel, ended up going bankrupt and had kind of a sad story. But this was uh, very instructive for me as far as just learning a lot about Florida and learning a lot about its history. So if you're getting started, I have a few tips for you about it. So you're probably trying to select a location or you may have one in mind and there's different reasons that you might want to do one. Uh, I gave you some of the reasons I chose to do one. Uh, but when you think about it, try to focus your study. And this is going to be the hardest part because, you know, I wanted to boil the ocean to begin with. And I think I've got like, I used the 1860 census and I've got like two or 300 profiles in here and it was way too much work. And don't do that. Uh, try to get it down to like maybe 150 people is very manageable. Now you can grow it. You can uh, keep going after that, but try to get very focused. And look at all of the information that's available in the area. So uh, I chose the 1860 census, but what you may recall about the 1860 census is that there just was not a lot of uh, information available about the family. So I didn't know who was a wife. I didn't know who was a daughter. Uh, so the 1860 census was a little bit of a failure in that regard. Uh, the 1880 census had a little bit more information, but the 1900 census it tells you who's married, when they got married, it lists the relationships. So that's a pretty good uh, census if you want to go that route. Another thing after I did the census, I realized that in 1880, they had a landowner's map and it showed everyone who owned land. And then I found out the Bureau of Land Management actually controlled Florida and who got the properties. It's different from Kentucky, which uh, went by land grants and, and land ownership in Kentucky proved to be a little bit more difficult than what it was in Florida. In Florida, I could see how big the land was. I could see who owned the land. It was much nicer. So if I had it to do over, I would have started with the 1880 uh, landowners uh, map that I had. Another thing I found out is there's basically only two cemeteries in Enterprise. Uh, there's the one that um, is, the, is the big one. And then there was a little small family cemetery. But what I liked about if I'd kind of uh, focused on that a little bit more is I would see the people who actually stayed in the area because of the 250 profiles I went through, there was about uh, there was 25 men who were there working with the steamship industry that I couldn't find anything else about them. So they just kind of disappeared. And they may have been running from the Civil War, so they may have went west and changed their names, or they may have died. I don't know. Uh, but that was uh, useful. Uh, you know, if the cemetery would help me locate the family and would help me understand who stayed in the area, because that's what's interesting is who stayed in that area and what did they do after that. So I hope those tips help you out. And I am going to pass this over to Amy Gilpin. Hi, everyone. Um, so my study is the Lanark County Place Study. And I started the study as a resource for my local genealogical society um, to help us with research efforts and uh, to give our members a place to go and learn some history about our county. And I very quickly realized that a county-sized study is an impossible endeavor. <laughs> so I have since broken it down into many smaller studies. And I will probably break it down into even smaller studies yet. Um, so for example, Lanark Highlands. Um, if we scroll down just a little to the list of studies, I think you should be coming up to it a little. There we go. Um, so Lanark Highlands is where I grew up, and that's uh, where I spend most of my personal research. Um, and so you can see that I have some... Uh, 
statistics and just basic data about the size, uh, the population, the different uh, population numbers for certain time periods. And um, I've started a list of notables uh, as well. And of course, I link all the resources and some uh, local uh, websites that can help give further information on each area. Um, the people that I am focusing on, um, it covers the time period from 1816 when Lanark County was first uh, organized and surveyed and it goes right through until modern day so again not for the faint of heart it's an extremely large study uh but as i said the goal of the study is to provide a a good place for members of the genealogical society and residents of lantern county to just come and find the information that they may be looking for um, I spend a lot of time um, focused on families that came over from Scotland, um, in particular those that settled here and then those that actually decided to move on. Lots of them went to Utah, uh, so that ties in with my interest in the um, United States research projects that I work on too. The, I think the biggest thing is to um, not get bogged down in such a large study. While it's helpful, it, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, and it's probably better to start the opposite way and go from a very small study and build up and connect to larger studies or different studies and make a hub of information rather than go from top down and start with a big place and break it down into smaller ones. Um, as you can see, Lanner County has uh, started out with many, many small townships and so each one is represented in the census uh, with their own entries, uh, own districts. And over time with amalgamations, the townships have all gotten larger rather than smaller. Uh, so what was once Lanark Township has now been joined with Levant, uh, Lanark Village, Dalhousie Township and uh, North Sherbrooke to form what we call today Lanark Highlands. Um, and again, each of those townships have their own hamlets and villages and cemeteries. And um, so, and that each of those are also, they could be a one place study on their own. So uh, that is, that is the, uh, the fun part of doing a large one place study is you're always finding new things to work on. Um, and I think that's probably, that's probably, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. That's probably the uh, the biggest challenge is, is figuring out where you want to focus your work. Um, I've got some people that are helping out with it uh, and working on census entries. So that's been beneficial. Um, and again, my, my biggest part is trying to connect some of our in immigrant families from Scotland back to, uh, back to Scotland. I think it's interesting that each of you have come about your one place study in different ways. So it's fascinating to me to see as you're come to a ghost town, knowing that it pretty much had an end. And there's something a little satisfying knowing that you can create this little capsule of time 
and that it will end. And then it's if you go to Lucas, Lucas, you live in this home and you wanted to research who else has lived in this home. What else has happened in this plantation area that you have? So you're not only you're researching your local history for your local historical group, but you're also just learning about who walked those floorboards in your home, who who actually lit those fires as well, and what work was done around your home. So that brings it from a ghost town that was thriving and then brings it down to your one little building, which is really kind of cool to see those comparisons in particular. And then what I love is, Donna, you started your one place study without having any invested family or knowledge of the who you would find in this particular orphanage. But your local historical genealogy group mentioned it. And you said, you know what? I think this would be interesting to document these young lives so they're not forgotten, which is really important. And then along the way, you helped connect to Azure's family. And who would have known? And this is what I say the power of Wikitree is, is collaboration with the projects and each other. So I bet in a million years when you went to that historical meeting and they talked about this particular orphanage, you would have never guessed you would have connected a family member to Azure Street. Well, and the thing is, is that that is a line that we didn't, we don't have any information about and we have no pictures of. So it was wonderful to see a picture of a family member for that line. And that right there, everything Azra said truly is the power of Wikitree. I, to, to realize that you can find out the history of your ancestor is really great. But to see a picture, it is heartwarming. It, 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 it leaves me speechless when you guys were talking about the connection there. It, I don't know of any other genealogical group that can come together and do this because I will tell you, I won't look, display the locations, but I will tell you, Azure and Don are nowhere near each other in the United States. So for them to come, for Azure to go to that meeting that Donna went to, that wouldn't have happened. That just probably right. wouldn't have happened. So that is kind of the power of Wikitree. And then Trisha and Amy, you guys kind of bring it in together. And I love Trisha that you decided to research and start your one place study because you just moved there. And it kind of like Lucas, you wanted to know who are the people that created this town? Who are the people that walk these streets and the people that made the town kind of where it is today. And you bring in the commerce as well. So that was really great. And Amy, you tell us in a great way how such a large one place study it's it's a monster and it will it's just too overwhelming. So you brought it a county down to the townships and you could even bring it down to street levels. Or if you have something like Lucas, you could bring it down to a house, a church. We have a lot of churches that are also one place studies on Wiki Tree, which I love seeing too, because a lot of the people at the churches we're buried in church cemeteries. So we're bringing in another project to the one place study as well. We're talking about the locations and maybe the churches and the cemeteries as we go along. And Amy kind of shows you, you can link them all together. If you have a really, really large one, start small, link them together so they're all seen. And I think with, with the exception of probably Azure's Ghost Town, I just want to make sure everybody understands the one place study will never be done in your lifetime. It will continue to grow. It will be continued to be a part of history. And you started it here on Wikitree. So that's pretty cool. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And you guys, I have learned a lot from each of you. I appreciate you guys being here for Wiki Day, Wikitree Day 2023. And if you're watching this Make sure to leave comments and we will get back to you in the comments as well as start your own one place study. Go to the project page. The description is in the bottom and with the link and we'll get you started on Wikitree. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.